Stothert? Here. Thompson? Here. Festerson? Here. Grant? Here. Gray? Yes. Jerome? Here. Mr. President? Here. All rise for the uh, Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for our invocation by Council Vice President Gurnett. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Lord, we pray with joy and thankfulness for your mercy to us as we begin our earthly work. And for all those that have had foot surgery, we ask for your healing hand, because I can feel their pain. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> city Clerk Certified Publication on the Daily Record on April 20th, notes for a pre council and regular city council meeting April 24th, 2012. A current copy of Open Meetings Act is posted in white binder on the east wall of the legislative chambers. Good afternoon and welcome. This Omaha City Council meeting is conducted in public and by law may only address the topics listed on the published agenda. The council will hear testimony but will not engage in debate of issues with the public at this meeting. During testimony, it is not appropriate to applaud or convey disapproval. These actions only detract from the formal decorum of the meeting. At this time, please turn off or mute any electronic device. Mr. Clerk. Uh, item number five is a reconsideration of a resolution to grant a package liquor license to downtown Food Mart at 318 South 16th Street. Motion approved. Well, we need a roll call on the reconsideration first. Roll call. Stothard? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gurnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerome? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. And Jerome passes a second time? Yes. For a potential conflict of interest. Now, item number five is back on the, the floor. Have a motion. Motion to not vote. Second. Is, it, is this a public hearing? Yeah. Well, you've had a public hearing, but if you want to call somebody up, you still can. Okay. It's like it's back on the floor. Uh, give us some of the latest information that you have on, on how this this, this uh, liquor store is operating. I'm Officer Hanson. I've been a police officer for almost 27 years. I've worked the uh, downtown beats for about the last 10. And my primary responsibility is dealing with quality of life issues. And that would be the panhandling, the open drinking, public intoxication, drug use. And on 16th Street, it's been a major problem. And a lot of that is centered at 16th and Harney. And the reason for that, I believe, is the single can sales at this establishment. Uh, I've talked to the owners in the past about selling to people who are intoxicated, and they tell me they check everyone by making them say their name and smile. That's a level of how they're intoxicated or not. I had a conversation with the owner two weeks ago about the goings on in front of her store. I said, I'm finding open cans right up against your front wall of the store. And she said, what happens in front of my store is not my responsibility. I said, this is your front yard. You need to keep it clean. And she said, no. And I said, it is. And she said, well, I try to chase off the panhandlers, but they come back and there's nothing I can do. And then she went back in the store. So that area for me has become a major, major problem because people can scrape together a couple dollars panhandling. They go inside, buy a single can of beer or liquor, very small cans, and then come out, drink it, get aggressive, panhandle more, and then it just turns into a vicious circle. So selling single cans in this location for me has been very detrimental to the area. Thank you, officer. I appreciate it. Um, I, just a couple of comments, Mr. President. Um, as you recall, a few weeks ago, we approved this license with the, and, and uh, my council member, Jerem, uh, asked them specifically about not selling single bottles, single cans, airplane shots, and they sat here, they stood here, and they agreed that they would do that. And no sooner that they walked out of here that they decided that they were not going to do it. Um, I just don't see, I don't have any, I don't have any sympathy for them at all, and I think the license ought to be denied. And we have a motion, motion and second. second. Roll call. Stothard? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gurnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerome? Yes. Passes. Mr. President? 
Yes. And Jeremy passes a second time for a potential conflict of interest. The request for a to grant a package liquor license was denied 601 passing. Uh, resolutions rate preliminary plats. Item number six, resolution that the preliminary plat entitled Ranch View Estates 3, located southwest of 213th and Walnut Street, along with attached conditions, hereby accepting the preparation of final plat is hereby authorized. A, Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing on agenda item number six begins now. Are there any proponents? Good afternoon, Mr. President, members of the council. My name is Jeff Elliott with ENA Consulting Group. Here to represent the applicant, and uh, with me today is, is the developer, Tom Falcone. Uh, here to ask for your approval of the preliminary plat for the Ranch View 3 subdivision. And just to get you oriented where we are, um, Pacific Street is on the north side of the subdivision here. Uh, the subdivision we're talking about is here on the southerly side of the re existing Ranch View Estates subdivision. It's accessed via 214th Street down to this subdivision area. The uh, proposed subdivision area is uh, approximately 21 acres. Uh, we're proposing 42 single-family homes in this area, and the proposed value of these homes are roughly a half a million dollar homes, $500,000. Our average lot size in the area is uh, just under half an acre at about four-tenths of an acre, um, about 18,000 square feet. Uh, the existing Ranch View Estates area is zoned R2 and R3. Uh, directly to the north of our subdivision is an R3 area. Uh, the balance of the subdivision is zone R2. We're requesting a uh, zoning of R2 to match the area uh, of the existing Ranch View Estates. Um, and so we're, we're proposing to match their zoning. Um, we have met with the neighbors a uh, number of times. Uh, I think they're still somewhat concerned about our subdivision. Uh, we started out with 44 lots and we've taken out two lots uh, to to uh, meet their request. So we're down from 44 to 42. Um, we do have two ways in and out of this subdivision existing, and we have platted two other ways in and out, one to the east for future development to the east, and also a street uh, extension that would extend out to the west. And so we believe that there's adequate access in and out of the subdivision I believe the uh, staff believes that as well. We've had numerous meetings with staff, and uh, they they believe that that access in and out of the subdivision is adequate uh, for what we're proposing to do. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have and, again, ask for your approval, as the planning board uh, did give us uh, unanimous approval of this. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? Yes. Please state your name and address. Uh, Gary Johnson, 21402 Walnut Street. Um, when, we, when many of us purchased our lots in, in Ranch View Estates, we were told by the previous developer that there, there would be development to the back uh, as proposed. Um, even even to a higher density, but it would not happen until there was a secondary egress point into the entire neighborhood, and that would be coming from Center Street. And uh, as is well known to the council, I'm sure is the the Skyline Woods thing went on for a lot of years and and uh, uh, never happened. Now that now that entry has been blocked by one individual, and that bought a bought some of the property in that, so that's probably not going to happen in the near future. We realize there's some egress points in here that have put in by the uh, the developer and that, but they may not come for many years. The, the neighborhood has actually started construction in approximately 2001, and uh, it has taken uh, this long, and we still have, I believe, seven lots in the entire 104-lot subdivision that have not been built on, uh, have not started construction. Um, 
one of our considerations is also is that that the promise holds true of the five hundred thousand dollar homes going in uh, it's concerning to us that all of the lots are so supposedly sold at a, at a price level of eighty thousand dollars each when most of the lots in the entire ranch view subdivision uh, and as i said have taken this long to fill up that these are sold instantly at this price level and so we're concerned about discounting and, and bulk sales and perhaps a lesser lesser degree of home uh, but the primary consideration that the entire neighborhood had from the very beginning when we had 80 percent opposition was, was the safety issue and the fact that we only had one egress point there's no question they have two entrances uh, out of the neighborhood that they are constructing but they all flow into ours that only has one way in and one way out so we're increasing something today that has 104 lots to 146 with only one possible immediate entry in that uh, into the entire neighborhood. Our concern is, or our thing that we feel like we're kind of being discriminated against is A, we have no direct representation because we are outside the city limits, and uh, we don't think this has happened anyplace else where you've had an existing neighborhood and nobody's been able to show us that. The planning department did show us two neighborhoods that, that were built with only one egress point. The one already has a second egress point, and the other one was a... Uh, uh, was a Hearthstone neighborhood that was built some years ago, and I'm sure there was supposed to be another tag along that would go with it by the same developer, but uh, the growth stopped in that area of the city, and, and of course the builder is, is uh, not active today. Uh, so we have a, a concern about that. Um, the price level uh, situation, and then comes the, the safety in that of the, the uh, sidewalks in the area and that the school uh, down there it seems to be very concerned about safety, but as the planning board, or not the planning board, the planning department, public works department told us that uh, uh, they advised not for the new Elkhorn Valley Middle School to be built there because of traffic concerns and that the city wouldn't be able to provide infrastructure for, for up to 10 years. We don't think the answer to that is to add to the neighborhood. We understand what cost the city would have to go to to add sidewalks all along Pacific Street. Just in this last uh, uh, two weeks and that, they have started putting uh, little warning signs of crosswalk while school is in session during the daytime in addition to the 25 mile an hour speed limits and crossing guards and everything. But. Uh, uh, I was there one night when there was a function going on and, and the, the, I had to sit and wait for about a, a two, three, no, five minutes and that is parents crossed with children and that to get over to the school because the, the parking lots were completely uh, plugged. That's going to happen from time to time. But as it is, Chris, kids cross over to get to the school right now through, uh, through a drainage culvert under Pacific Street because there, you know, nothing is set up between uh, the uh, Skyline neighbor or the Skyline Woods neighborhood over to the school. Our development is approximately, uh, I don't know, about a third of a mile down from that. We of course have sidewalks in front of the development, but there aren't any on Pacific Street. I, uh, when I supplied the information, our memo yesterday, I believe. I gave you a, uh, a diagram, if most of you have that. Uh, did, was that given yes. to them? Okay. And it kind of outlines the, uh, the way the neighborhood's set up. There's no question about it. Our neighborhood has uh, some uh, disparity amongst the, uh, the citizens as far as uh, getting all together, and that is by the very nature that it was developed. When the developer originally uh, built it, he started with the R1 development up first, uh, then he came along with the R2, and then added the R3. The R1 and the R2 uh, are covered by one SID and one uh, HOA, and the third one does not have an, it's got an HOA developed, but they've never assumed responsibility for the HOA, and uh, that alone creates a little disparity in the fact that RSID paid for all the road uh, going into the neighborhood, sewer system and everything. There is no SID for that other section. 
And so these people have a lower tax base than that, but yet we supplied all the infrastructure except for the roads that were paid for by the developer within their section. Uh, the new developer in that is going to, of course, have their own uh, set up an SID for the responsibility of that, but there's no cost of access uh, to getting all the way back in, which is over, I think it's over a half a mile in from where you enter the neighborhood. So those are some of our concerns that we feel that uh, we're kind of being treated unfairly, this kind of being jammed at us and that that we've got, and, and anyone can see by the map, it's a much higher density in the back than it is in, in the uh, front portions of the neighborhood. So that's kind of where we're at. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other opponents? I'm David Olch, 21403 Hickory Street. Appreciate uh, sitting down and listening to us today. I'll make it very brief. When we purchased our lot there a year and a half ago, here again, we were told that one day a development would come to the south there, which we had no problem with at all. But the biggest thing is there would have to be a second way in and out of that neighborhood for, for safety reasons. And a year and a half later, we're going to get the neighborhood to the south, but there's no, it's the second way in and out that bother me. I live on 214th Street, so <clears throat> I live on a roundabout right there. So when, at night, I see all the cars coming around. That's what I chose. It's a great lot, great neighbors and so forth. There's a lot of cars coming around there. When another 42 homes going around in the, in the back side of that, if, if you figure the average home has between the postman and the, the garbage people, et cetera, about 10 trips in and out a day, 214th Street become with 146 home, roughly 1,460 trips per day up and down 214th Street. What scares me about the whole thing, there's a lot of young families in the neighborhood. My, my children are older. They better know better than play in the street or not at their age. But the young kids that are, that are coming around, families walking up and down 214th Street, the pressure you're going to put on 214th Street without a second way in and out of the new neighborhood is going to be asked, it's going to be terrible. And unfortunately, in this case, it's not when, if it's going to happen, it's when is a kid going to get hit and killed on that street. And that's what's going to, you're going to have so much traffic down there. That's what really scares me. We've already got families about talking talk about moving out of the neighborhood. They're, they're afraid with that much traffic out there that that it's going to be a gun. Their, son, their son or daughter is going to have a problem one day and get hit out there. With a school there up to, on Pacific Street, that's the other issue. The pressure you're going to put by the school, when I come go to work in the morning fairly early, I see kids walking down the street, riding their bikes. There's, there's no sidewalks there. You're going to put a lot more pressure on Pacific Street. All we're asking for is a second way in and out of the new neighborhood before it starts and or, or, or less homes to alleviate some of that pressure. Thanks for listening to me today. Thank you. Are there any other opponents? Uh, my name is Derek Grouse, and I live on 214th and um, uh, Walnut, which is kind of right in the corner. Um, the dump trucks and everything go right past my driveway. Your address, sir? Uh, 21323 two, Walnut Street. Thank you. Um, Biggest concern is the second entrance, and I do have a young kid, and he likes to play in the street, even though I've told him not to. It doesn't seem to affect him. Um, but, uh, you know, it's I've had to call the cops just on the dump truck drivers, so I'm afraid, you know, when you add 44 houses back there, all the subs, um, it's, it's going to be a lot of pressure. So that's about all I really wanted to say. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any other opponents? Public hearing is closed. Ms. Stothert. No, quick rebuttal. Oh, would you care that, for... That would be okay. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff Elliott, e &A Consulting. <clears throat> I guess a couple things I'd just like to say as far as the second egress point, this isn't a uh, developing area. You've got a middle school and a high school and an elementary school around here, so uh, I can't imagine that it's going to be too awful long before this parcel to the east is going to be developed and then the connections that are um, were previously made in the existing ranch view area would be extended or the extensions that we have here uh, would be made. Also, I think you've 
heard recently their plans to redevelop the golf course in the skyline area. Uh, there's some potential development with that too, and there's an existing road here with a potential extension out that way as well. So I guess, in my opinion, I think fairly soon there'll be some development adjacent here to provide other access ways in and out. Um, as far as concern about price levels of the homes, uh, we are zoning this at R2. Uh, they have to, we have to meet the requirements of that zoning district. Um, you're not going to build a small house on these large size lots here. So I can't see that that would be a concern. As far as traffic load, um, you know, the gentleman mentioned having to wait five minutes for a crossing. That's pretty typical in any residential area where there's children and traffic and and, and that going on. Um, adding 42 lots into this development area, the planning department and the planning board really didn't see a problem with that happening. I don't, as an engineer, see a problem with adding 42 lots on this uh, residential road. Uh, there are many areas with with more lots um, in them, with more traffic than, than this is going to add into the area. So with that, um, I guess the other, the last thing they mentioned about subcontractors traveling through the area, you know, at one time there are homes under construction in this existing area. They were dealing with those subcontractors while that was happening. The same is going to happen with, with these new homes that are being built. So with that, I'll close my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Stothard. Thanks. Um, I, I would like to ask Mr. Johnson to come back up. I didn't take the rest of your names down, so I'll just I'll ask you, and maybe you could represent the the group and just say your name and address again. Okay. I just want to clarify a couple of things. Okay. Uh, Gary Johnson, two R's, whatever that buys you, <laughs> uh, and it's two one four zero two Walnut Street. Thank you. And I think it's important to point out anybody listening to this today that, and you pointed out before too, although you are not in the city, you are within the city's zoning jurisdiction. So that's why that's we're, we're dealing with this today. But of, of the opponents that live in, in the neighborhood, in the Ranch View 1 and 2, is, is it your desire to add another entrance or exit, period? Or is your desire not to have this development happen at all? Our desire would be to, if, if we're going to compromise, is it to be much smaller than it is and much more like probably the front of the neighborhood looks because that's our compromise, that there's less houses and that. And, and, you know, I think there needs to be a second egress on the thing, but these people purchase the property in that, and obviously they're trying to maximize their profitability. I understand where they're coming from on that. but. We've got to live there, okay. and that's the thing. We have to put up to the traffic. The everybody that's on here today, uh, and that, and, and I said, as I said before, there's been some disparity amongst the neighborhood because we're not a unified group to begin with because of the fact that we have a unique situation that there's, we can't have one HOA because we we have one SID and one non-SID, and and we've been advised that we can't. That would be a liability situation. And so we don't. And, and we only found, found this out uh, at the beginning of this year, within the last four months, when we were trying to organize the front HOA, uh, found out that uh, when we got copies of the uh, legal documents that, hey, there's two sets. Uh, there was actually two HOAs in that, and, and of course the, the previous developer had 100% control of all the HOAs in that, and so we were a little bit uh, ignorant in, in what we had there. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me, um, Mr. Cunningham, Planning Director? Rick Cunningham, Planning Director. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you, because this was the Planning Board and Planning Department recommended approval, can you speak a little bit to um, the, the issue with having only one exit and entry point. And as we look at this, I know we can see from this map now, there's a lot of land on either side um, that is potentially going to be developed, but it would seem like if we would put a, a road in there right now, wouldn't make a lot of sense because there isn't any development there now. And then speak a little bit to uh, what you know about the golf course south of there. Well, I'm going to start, then I'm going to ask Assistant Director Chad Weaver to step up to the podium to share uh, some of the uh, dialogue and facilitation that uh, the Planning Department uh, uh, 
participated in in this whole process. But as you uh, <coughs> pointed out, if you look at the map and look to the east and west, there are large areas of, of undeveloped land. And, and, and at this point, there are stubbed out right-of-ways and streets uh, that were uh, planned in in order to, uh, to attach to and connect with future developments in those, in those directions, as there uh, were stubs out to the south to connect to developments to the south. As we find ourselves at this point in time, uh, the best opportunity to get another uh, connection is to the south uh, with this subdivision planned and then the uh, renovation, re retrofitting of the golf course and development already to the south. Um, the, uh, the developers there are, are anticipating um, uh, adding some homes down there and redoing the holes to replicate, replicate famous holes across uh, the golfing world. Uh, but uh, if you look at the subdivision that's already there, there is a stubbed out road going to the north that roughly aligns where we have stubbed out a road from this new proposed subdivision going to the south. So uh, we have begun that dialogue, in fact, with uh, those uh, developers that are proposing that development to the south. So at this point in time, uh, the best opportunity to get that second uh, connection is to the south. And with that, I'd ask uh, Chad to share with you um, some of the, uh, the discussions that we had uh, in the process the planning board went through to, uh, to approve this, uh, which was not it was not easy, slam dunk. You know, there was a lot of discussion on that. Uh, then uh, we can answer any other questions you might have. Chad? Chad Weaver, Planning Department. Uh, briefly, we did have ongoing conversations throughout the duration of, uh, of this project with Public Works and with uh, Fire Department from a traffic and emergency response perspective. Uh, uh, Ryan Haas, one of the engineers in the traffic division, is here to echo my sentiments if you need him to, but uh, suffice it to say that the traffic capacity, the carrying capacity in terms of numbers of cars will not nearly be reached by the addition of this subdivision. And by not nearly, I mean probably by maybe 10% 10, 10 of what it could carry in terms of a street. Um, from an from a, uh, access perspective for emergencies and so forth, um, uh, we didn't receive any initial uh, comments from the fire uh, fr fire department. So I doubled back with them uh, after the first planning board meeting. Uh, they echoed that they didn't have any official comments. It's not ideal. They, they'll, as much as anyone, uh, like to see those future connections get made, uh, but it's not something that rises to the level that they're willing to uh, to try to prevent at this point. So. Um, in terms of the process, they did uh, appear at a couple of different planning board meetings. Uh, they got laid over at one point for the developer to go back and meet with the neighbors, try to come to some resolution. I think that's where a couple of the lots got uh, got eliminated. Um, and then, the, as has been indicated already, the, the plan was approved uh, subsequent. So uh, I, I've got information in terms of lot size and configuration if you'd like to hear it. But um, otherwise, I guess I'll just uh, see if there are any other questions. So from your perspective, a, a, a development of this size, that, that one entry exit point is, is adequate? It's adequate. I mean, I, if it was going to be permanent, we might look at it differently. But since it's not going to be permanent, uh, we're, we're willing to, uh, to move forward at this point and, and, and have those connections occur in the future. As, as uh, Rick indicated, that, that may be sooner rather than later with the, with the golf course coming forward. To the south. Because, yeah, again, when you look at that map there, what's that whole area, how it's developed to the right or to the east and to the west, mm -hmm. it would seem, would seem impractical to try to put any type of road there at this point in time. So it would have to be to the south yeah, if there, you there, put an additional. Obviously, there will be full-scale development coming in through here. There's not really any right. place to go now with the road on its own. Uh, there, this is an existing stub that, that is at the golf course now. Uh, they had some, some right-of-way segments kind of planned or platted at one point to connect up this way. Uh, we're we're going to be working with them to, just to make that connection that, that is stubbed here, as you can see in the existing plat that we're talking about today. So I mean, that seems like the quickest and most efficient way to provide that outlet. And what, what's, what's the time frame of that happening? To the south there? The golf, well, I mean, they've, they've just begun their work, at but least they in are, terms of okay. their interaction with us. Okay. All right. I think that's all I have. Thanks. Madam Councilwoman, I just signed the pre-app letter for that sub, that new uh, work down to the south. So they are beginning the, the process of dialogue, and they're at the very beginning with a pre-app letter. All right. Thank you. did you? I got my questions answered. Okay. Uh, Mr. Weaver, could you? 
Chad Weaver, City Planning. What is your uh, projected traffic count for 214th Street? I believe I have that number here, but I, I don't know if I can lay hands on it very quickly. It's, it's rather low based on a residential use. And again, this is something that was generated by Public Works. Looks to me like um, daily trips, um, worst case scenario, which was calculated as a Saturday, was 1,600 and peak hour trips was 170, which as I indicated is, is, is not begin to use up the capacity of a two lane street. Mm -hmm. There's, there's how, no how doubt that it will be different than what they ex experience now, but it's it's not a capacity problem. Uh, what, what, what level would trigger that you would be hesitant? Well, I mean, I, yeah, in terms of carrying capacity of a street, we're not close. I mean, you have arterials like Pacific that carry through trips in the thousands, and a two-lane street can accommodate that number of trips. But this is a residential neighborhood, so I uh, mean, would you say 5,000, 10,000? You'd probably have to. I, I think I tried to get a, a number like that from Public Works, and I don't think there's one they could really hazard, um, but you, you probably have to ask them directly. There, there, are, there are numbers of, of, of streets through neighborhoods that, that handle somewhere in the thousands of, of trips daily without any tip. Any, any but everyone problems. within the city was comfortable with what we're progressing with here today. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, fine. Thank you. Yeah. Roll call. Stothard? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gurnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. It's adopted on a 7 0 vote. Pursuant to City Council Rule 70, agenda item number 7 should be laid over two weeks for publication and public hearing. Pursuant to City Council Rule 70, agenda item number 8 should be laid over two weeks. Pursuant to City Council Rule 70, agenda items number 9 through 10 should be laid over two weeks for publication and public hearing. Liquor, item number 11, another neighbor's bar, uh, 5004 Dodge Street. Class C liquor license, new application, new location. We have a communications from Jay Davis. Uh, they have some issues with the permits, and you would either have to lay this over or make it contingent on getting the proper permits, and you have a communications from the Neighborhood Association. And the new DBA is uh, Page Turner's Lounge. Public hearing on agenda item number 11 begins now. Are there any proponents? <coughs> Good afternoon, Mr. President, members of the council. My name is Sean Kelly, 7134 Pacific Street, Omaha, Nebraska, here today on behalf of the applicant. We did talk to the Neighborhood Association. They're supportive. Uh, we will voluntarily ask that you restrict the license to uh, no single sales off sale. Certainly want to sell single sales within the establishment. Um, and this won't be a live music venue. I think we've made that clear. Um, they will do um, a pianist at happy hour, things like that, but no concerts or ticket sales or anything like that. In addition to that, with permits, uh, I believe Jay Davis is comfortable with approving or recommending approval of the license conditioned upon the fact that we do get approval uh, for the license. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Mr. Festerson. Thanks, Mr. President. I view this as a positive development along the Dodge Street corridor here. It's, it's nationally known Omaha, and first of all, reinvesting in his neighborhood, which is a positive and continues what's been a great music and social scene, I think, for Omaha and for Omaha on, on the national scene. I thought it was interesting that when this became news of even just the application, it was national news in terms of some of the music industry and music magazines that that are that are watching Omaha and what it's doing in this regard. And then it continues the development pattern along Dodge Street that's occurred recently with the varsity uh, opening there and the renovation of that building. And of course some positive things we have right nearby with Goldbergs and some other great neighborhood bars and institutions and kind of has the same objective to reclaim that street and have it be a lively, uh, a lively situation for for these businesses and, and create jobs that come with that. Um, just a couple questions, though, for Mr. Kelly that I think he addressed a, f a couple of them. I was going to ask, but I had a couple more. As he indicated, the neighborhood association has been engaged and they um, indicated some positive feelings about the application, but had just a couple questions. So I, I wanted to, direct, to address those too. 
One of which you're, you already talked about, so there's no, no concerts uh, in the facility, right? Correct, Sean Kelly, 7134 Pacific. Uh, Councilman Fessman, that's correct. No concerts, no ticket sales, anything like that. There may be a piano on back, maybe somebody pulls out a guitar sometimes, but that's, that's certainly it. possible, right. There's a patio outside. It's it's a very small bar, first of all. Capacity mm -hmm. about 50 people. Uh, the, the front patio will be a very small um, linear footage. But they do want to have a patio outside, but there'd be no music out there either, right? No. To my knowledge, no, there'd be no music. And so really the only issue then becomes the single, no, no single off-sale sales, which you've agreed to, and I think we'll make a condition of the license. And then parking, just making sure there's no parking that occurs in the neighborhood as a result. But again, with a 50-person capacity, I think you've been talking with the uh, owners of a lot there that'll also accommodate that overflow. Do you want to describe that a little bit? Right. The applicant does have use of the parking lot and, and back, and um, I think the, the commercial neighbors are comfortable with the, the parking and, and if the planning department will require us to get more parking we certainly will and we are not adverse to talking to the radio station down on Dodge and we, we have not had that conversation with but if that is an issue the applicants would be more than happy to secure additional parking okay and the hours of operation are I saw four four to two Monday through Friday two to two on a Saturday so probably don't overlap much with the other right. businesses there anyway we'll never be open during the lunch hour and I, I think they, if they anticipate car, uh, crowds, it'd be likely after the, the dinner hour. Okay. Thanks. I don't, I don't know if there'll be additional comments or not on the application, but I will move approval subject to receiving the necessary permits from planning and subject to no single off-sale um, sales. Second. Roll call. Stothard? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Garnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerome? Yes. Mr. President. Yes. And Jerome passes a second time for a potential conflict of interest. It's a adopted 601 passing. Item number 12, the mill, 13806 P Street, Class C liquor license, new application, new location. Public hearing on agenda item number 12 begins now. Are there any proponents? Welcome, members of the council. Uh, my name is J.D. Cunningham, um, general manager of the mill. And your address, please, sir. Uh, my address is 7517 North 73rd Avenue. Um, we are here uh, applying for a liquor license. Uh, the Mill Bar and Grill will be a, a neighborhood friendly business serving spirits and food. Um, our menu is going to feature things such as fresh Angus burgers, pizzas, steaks, salads, hand dipped milkshakes, and a variety of other items, including daily food and drink specials. <clears throat> uh, we will include kino and darts. Maybe at a future time, we will include some karaoke. Uh, there will be no live music um, outside of maybe like a, we'll have like a jukebox, of course. Um, we will be an active member of the business community. Uh, we do plan on joining the Millard Business Association as well as the Omaha Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we will provide business solutions uh, for the neighboring businesses, including uh, providing a business-to-business -business, uh, delivery service for lunch uh, for the businesses in the direct Millard area. Um, we are a completely remodeled uh, building. Uh, we will feature a state-of-the-art security system, um, including um, <clears throat> outdoor cameras all along the strip mall, which is provided by the property owner and uh, as well as um, renovations to the parking lot and landscaping. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Roll call. Stothard? Yeah. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Garnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. It's adopted seven to zero. Yeah. Item number 13 and 14 go together. Uh, 13 is O Face Bar, 1014 South 74th Plaza, a Class C liquor license, no application, no location, and 14 is a catering license for the same applicant at the same location. Public hearing on agenda items number 13 and 14 begin now. Are there any proponents? Afternoon, everybody. Matthew Overmeyer, 10610 South 17th Street, Bellevue. Um, my wife and I, we are owners of O-Face Bar in Council Bluffs. Uh, we've been open for a year over there. It's, uh, it's been interesting, that's for sure. It's the first business we've ever owned, and um, so far we've been very successful. 
the policies and stuff that we adopt over there as far as security, um, IDs, that sort of stuff, we want to implement over there. Uh, we know that <clears throat> from information we've heard from other people of past owners, past property in that area, that there has been an issue with that. Uh, and I understand that, and that's our number one goal is to make sure that no matter what, that doesn't happen. Uh, we try to bring a fun, lively atmosphere. Um, we do karaoke, dance music, occasionally the uh, small live band of that nature, uh, acoustical guitarists, things like that. Um, we try to do uh, different things. Uh, we have a, on Sunday nights we do a blackout night where we do everything kind of by uh, low dim lights and everything and bring in an acoustical guitarist and keep it nice and soft and laid back and give some people something to relax to before they hit the Monday work week. Um, we do not serve, intend to serve food at all. Uh, it will be just strictly beer, liquor. Uh, any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Approval. Roll call. Stothard. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Garnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerome? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. It's adopted 7 to 0. Item number 15, Oasis Hookah Bar and Cafe, uh, 1507 Farnham Street, Cigar Bar, new application, new location. They currently hold a Class C, or a pending Class C liquor license, and you have communications opposing. Public hearing on agenda item number 15 begins now. Are there any proponents? Uh, Jesse Hill, 1802 North 28th Street. Um, greeting council members, I'm coming before you today seeking a cigar bar license for Oasis Hookah Bar. If you remember last month I came before the council asking for a Class C liquor license so I will ultimately be able to obtain a cigar bar license. After my lengthy speech, the council was benevolent enough to entrust me with a Class C liquor license. So I stand today asking for the second component of the liquor license needed for my business and that is a cigar bar license. Since the last time I stood before you, I was sent a special request by the Nebraska Liquor Control Commission to have all of my staff enroll and complete a bar training program. This training makes sure that all my staff know how to properly check ID, know how to tell signs of intoxication, as well as know all the governing liquor laws in the state of Nebraska. All my employees successfully took and completed this training, and I have copies of all certificates of the council would like to see them. Aside from the request that the Liquor Commission has asked of us, we have also satisfied and completed the state requirements to have a cigar bar. We will not sell food. We have shown that more than 10% of our gross revenue will come from cigars, as well as other tobacco-related products. At the present time, 100% of our revenue comes from the sale of these products products. We have installed a custom walk-in humidor at our new premises, which is large enough to hold two or more adults, and I have given the commission the $1,000 non-refundable check to process the paperwork for the cigar bar license. Having satisfied all requirements by the state, I see no reason why Oasis should not be granted a cigar bar license. However, I do not just wish to satisfy the state requirements. In an effort to show that Oasis Hookah Bar and myself will go above and beyond the minimum requirements, I set up a number of security measures to make sure that Oasis is a pillar of public safety and an overall safe and secure business for my customers. If you remember, last time I was here, I made it a point to explain how I would be proactive in the community to ensure that Oasis is not only a safe business, but also a business that goes above and beyond how normal bars operate. Oasis has set up an account with Happy Cab Taxi so that in the rare event a customer has too much to drink and does not have a ride home at our establishment, we will front the cost for the safe ride. We have also have a eight camera security system installed to help catch any persons trying to either illegally consume alcohol or pass alcohol to a minor. We have also acquired an ID scanner to make sure to prevent any and all underage drinking. We have a marking system to clearly be able to define people of age versus minors. We have different glassware for minors and people 21 up. I have a diligent staff that IDs every person that walks through the door and sees them in their respective sections. And I've also hired a third party, Metro Shield Security, to run security inside Oasis during the weekends to check IDs and make sure there is a clear divide between minors and people of age. Along with all these precautions, I've even gone a step further to make sure that Oasis helps keep downtown Omaha as safe as it can possibly be. I've uh, approached Billy Patrios, owner of Whiskey Tango, an apartment building located next door to it, and we have set up an agreement for Oasis to help pay for the cost of some of the police officers Whiskey Tango already has in place. This will make sure that there is a police presence outside of Oasis to help even further detour any underage drinking or rowdy behavior. I must 
point out that these are all arrangements and steps Oasis has taken without even having a usable liquor license or being asked to do so outside anyone in my company. In fact, Oasis has already confiscated and turned over to the authorities two fake IDs in a few weeks we have been open at the new location. I've even set up a bounty system for my employees if they catch a fake ID or stop underage drinking in progress and report it to police. They're given a bonus for the diligence and ensuring that Oasis is staying above the curve and maintaining our zero tolerance stance. In the nearly two years the Oasis has been open, we have had a spotless record in our community. We have never, we have had no record of violence amongst my patrons. We have not been cited for selling tobacco to minors, and we have proven that I know how to run a competent and safe business. My record speaks for itself. I put a great deal of time and money into my establishment. It has been my passion for the past two years. I will never do anything to jeopardize having the business I built, built from scratch shut down due to negative tavern reports about us serving liquor to minors or rowdy customers. I, stand, I understand and appreciate the responsibility and trust given to me by this council by you all having faith in me that I can operate a business with a liquor license. I give you my word as an Eagle Scout, a member of Phi Beta Sigma, and as a man that will not let you or the city down. With that being said, I see no reason why Oasis should not be granted its cigar bar license so that we can begin to utilize our Class C liquor license. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Yes, my name is uh, Eric Curtis, 5513 North 37th Street, Omaha, Nebraska. And just like Jesse said, uh, I'm in business with him as well. Uh, me and my wife, we have a, a bar called the X Lounge, which recently opened at the beginning of the year. We also have two other businesses, closing and also a hookah outlet that I do online that I also sell. So uh, like Jesse said, I've been knowing him for about two years and we and him been in business now for about six months. And uh, ever since I've been there, uh, I noticed that he, he, his, him and his people have been displaying the, the, the highest professionalism of all. And they do, they do, they do a great job down there. And uh, I would like for you guys to grant them the liquor license if see fit. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Mr. Jerem. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I have had some communication in opposition to this, basically expressing the same opposition that existed the last time around, and that is the overall arching concern, not against Jesse himself, because people, including myself, have a, a good, favorable opinion of you, it's just the business plan that raises concerns in our mind um, when you have a hookah bar business that basically uh, promotes to and appeals to an underage crowd that it's a, basically a recipe for um, enticing underage people to attempt to procure alcohol and while you you know hope and intend and have all these precautions in place um, Young people are pretty ingenious when it comes to uh, things that they can do to, to somehow end up with an out, a drink in their hand. So it's not against you, Jesse. I think you're a good person and you intend well and you certainly have uh, gone above board in terms of things that you plan to do to try to um, prevent that from happening. But I just don't like the mix between the underage and the adult crowd. So I won't be voting for this. Mr. Gray. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm, I'm just going to be very brief. Um, I supported it last time. I will support it again this time. Um, I think there are, uh, and, and um, you know, there's always that concern, but we can't continue to, I mean, we, we've got to give you an opportunity to see what you can do. Um, and I, I, I um, you present well. You've put together what I consider to be a really good staff. You have followed up with, um, good security um, and you know while there are some challenges with the business plan I won't disagree that there are challenges with the business plan I think you have I, I'm gonna su subscribe to my colleague to the right I'm, I'm gonna subscribe to his theory of giving you one chance so I'm gonna continue to support it and I make a motion to approve roll call Stothard no. Thompson no. Festerson yes. Garnett yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? No. Mr. President? Yes. It's adopted on a four to three vote. Item number 16, Who Hunt Mongolian Grill request permission to appoint Roger Knievel, manager of their present class I liquor license. 
Public hearing on agenda item number 16 begins now. Are there any proponents? My name is Roger Knievel, uh, 116 Citadel Drive, Papillion. And I'm here to uh, get an approval on this. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? <laughs> Are there any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Mr. Thompson. Um, Sir, if I could have you come back up. Sure. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'd get booed tomorrow. I, and you would know if I did. Um, this is just a, a question in terms of working with your neighbor to the north. I was wondering if you guys have worked out your uh, differences in parking. At this time, yes, we have. You have? Yes. So if I give him a call, he would say that the two of you have come to a, a nice working agreement about parking? Um, that may be up to the landowner himself. Okay. Uh, his name is uh, Mark Van, Van Osdale. I know Mark. Mm -hmm. But are you reaching out and communicating? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, motion to approve. Second. Roll call. Stothert? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gurnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Approved 7 to 0. Item number 17. Uh, Red Robin American Gourmet Burgers and Spirits, 14455 West Maple Road, request permission to appoint Elizabeth Bloomer's manager. Public hearing on agenda item number 17 begins now. Are there any proponents? I'm Elizabeth Boomer, 14611 Names Plaza. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Roll call. Stothard? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gurnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Approved 7 to 0. Consent agenda. Any member of the City Council may cause an item placed on the consent agenda to be removed. Items removed from consent agenda shall be taken up by the City Council immediately following the consent agenda in the order in which they were removed unless otherwise provided by the City Council rules of order. The public hearings on agenda items number 18 through 24 were held on April the 17th, 2012. Roll call. Stothard? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gurnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. They're all passed 7 to 0. We are removing item number 37 from the consent agenda on the resolutions. The public hearings on agenda items number 25 through 26 and number 38 are today. If you wish to address the City Council regarding these items, please come to the microphone. Indicate the agenda item number you wish to address. Identify yourself by your name, address, who you represent, and if you are a proponent or opponent. Public hearing is closed. Roll call. Thompson. Or Stothard. Yes. Thompson. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Garnett. Yes. Gray. Yes. Jerem. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Now, uh, they're all adopted seven to zero. Okay, seven is the appointment of Amy Haas as a member of the Transit Authority Board. Second. Roll call. Motion to lay over four weeks and continue the public hearing, I believe, right? That is correct. Roll call. Stothard? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Garnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Item number 39, ordinance to adopt a new article of Chapter 38 entitled pedicabs to require a permit for the operation of a pedicab on certain streets in the area of the College World Series during the time period of that event is an amendment. Public hearing on agenda item number 39 was held on April the 17th. Roll call. Stothard? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Garnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Roll call. Dothard? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Garnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Uh, passed as amended 7 to 0. Pursuant to City Council Rule 70, the public hearing agenda items 
40 through 43 shall be held on the third reading. Ordinance on second reading. Item 44, ordinance from agreement for the sale of city-owned real property to the Omaha Economic Development Corporation located at 2108 North 25th Street for the development of affordable housing. Public hearing on agenda item number 44 begins now. Are there any proponents? Are there any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Item 45, ordinance to amend chapter 10 by adding a new section 10-263.1 entitled school district number 10 to provide a fee exemption to the schools located in school district number 10, commonly known as Elkhorn School District. Public hearing on agenda item number 45 begins now. Are there any proponents? Are there any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Item 46, ordinance to establish a new Class A flammable liquid storage district, A149 at 1613 North 11th Street. Public hearing on agenda item number 46 begins now. Are there any proponents? Are there any opponents? Public, <coughs> public hearing is closed. Item 47, ordinance to approve the acceptance and authorize the distribution of a grant uh, to provide funding for coordinating, coordination, investigation, and training activities to combat drug trafficking. Public hearing on agenda item number 47 begins now. Are there any proponents? Are there any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Item number 48, ordinance approving interlocal agreement between the city and Douglas County uh, for the continuation of the Omaha Douglas Technology Commission uh, for an additional term until December 31st, 2016. Public hearing on agenda item number 48 begins now. Are there any proponents? Are there any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Ms. Stothert. Thank you. Um, what you have before you today is the interlocal agreement between the city and Douglas County for continued operation for the Douglas Omaha Technology Committee. And as was said, for an additional period ending on December 31st, 2016, this new interlocal agreement provides for the methodology which the city and the county will continue to work together cooperatively to provide information technology services and support for the city and the county in a efficient and uh, efficient manner. I do want to point out um, some of the summary of the main changes in this interlocal agreement for your information. Um, this does establish a new, uh, uh, two new positions and it is the city and county IT coordinators. Uh, the new interlocal agreement does define the role of those coordinators. Um, it does change the governance and the responsibility of the dot-com board and it will now be replaced by a dot-com oversight committee. And that committee will consist of um, different people than it, the board did previously. It will consist of the city's finance director, the county's finance director, um, two city employees that are appointed by the mayor and confirmed by the council, two Douglas County employees, and then one Douglas County resident or a civilian member. Um, this was, and, and other, it defines other areas in the, um, in the new interlocal too, for clarity. Um, this will be uh, discussed at the dot-com committee on Thursday, and then it will be back for our approval. I do believe that, um, Mr. Indebosch, can you come down for a moment, please? That the county board did um, approve two amendments to this interlocal agreement this morning, and I'd just like Mr. Indebosch to describe what those were. Bernard Indenbosch, Assistant City Attorney. Uh, you, you are correct that the county board approved the interlocal agreement this morning. They did make two amendments to it. Uh, the two amendments uh, were proposed by uh, Chairperson Mark Kraft and, and basically inserted uh, into the third bullet point in paragraph A in dealing with the city and county employees that are appointed, it makes clear that the process for removal of those employees is much like the process for approval of them, which is the mayor can recommend removing the people and that the city council would then act to remove those members and similarly, uh, similar provision for the county employees, for the county board to remove those members. So it's just, I think, it makes explicit what is probably implicit within the agreement. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. 
Mr. Clerk. Item number 49 is the Artists Approved Lease Agreement with the Bema Center for Contemporary Arts. Public hearing will be held on third reading on May 1st. Uh, pursuant to City Council Rule 7F, agenda items 50 through 53 shall be laid over three weeks for publication of public hearing. Pursuant to City Council Rule 7D, the public hearing on agenda items 54 through 56 shall be held on the third reading. Pursuant to City Council Rule 7C, the public hearing on agenda items 57 through 60 shall be held on the second reading. And on the supplement, pursuant to City Council Rule 7C, the public hearing on agenda item 62 shall be held on the second reading. Motion to adjourn. Second. Roll call. Stothard. Thompson, yes. Festerson, yes. Kernett, yes. Gray, yes. Jerem, yes. Mr. President, yes. three o'clock. Well, the good news is we finished exactly with the right number of roll calls.